Welcome viewers and listeners to another edition of CHP Talks. I'm here today with Jordan Guildford, Guildford I'm sorry, uh, who represents an organization called Gems for Gems. And I'm going to give her an introduction in a moment. But uh, Jordan, thank you for joining us today from Calgary. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So Jordan uh, calls herself a small, a small town Nova Scotian girl who moved to Calgary in 2014. Once she arrived in Calgary, she saw a desperate need and she initiated a successful jewelry drive to give gifts on Christmas morning to survivors of domestic abuse. And she discovered that the public were very eager to help survivors with their time, energy and skills. This led to her creating a national charity called Gems for Gems, focused on bringing an end to the cycle of domestic abuse and in collaboration with public uh, involvement. Gems for Gems has given over 20,000 gifts on Christmas morning across the country. They've assisted thousands of survivors, helping them to develop essential skills, financial literacy, preventative self-defense, resilience, and psychological coping skills, and empowerment building a scholarship program for survivors, and they launched an ambassador program comprised of men and women, all unified under the same mission. The Gems for Gems ambassador program spans Canada and the U.S., as well as having three celebrity ambassadors within the team. Most recently, Jordan and her team at Gems for Gems have launched uh, an initiative called Hope's Cradle, and this initiative is a, a partnership with fire departments to provide a safe surrender location for mothers who feel there is no other alternative to ensure the safety of their babies. And we're going to talk more about that today. In the course of her work, Jordan has received the following awards, and it's it's uh, quite amazing to read the list. Uh, she received the Queen's Platinum Jubilee Medal in 2023, the top five inspiring business leaders revamping the future from Eminence Globe magazine, uh, CIO Times, the top five most efficient women leaders shaping the industry. 2022, she received the Colbert Family Award for Philanthropy, uh, the Glorious Is She Inspiration Award, the Redwood Classic Community Changemaker Award, the CIO Today Most Influential Leader, the Create the Ripple Featured Author, and Aspioneer Top 20 Under 40 International Leaders. In 2021, she received the Monarch Collective International Women's Day Shine Together Award, 2019 uh, Avenue Calgary, Top 40 Under 40, and 2019 Calgary Change Maker of the Year. So that's uh, a lot of approval from a lot of different organizations, Jordan. And uh, I know you're not, uh, you didn't come on here to talk about your your achievements. You came here to talk about Hope's Cradle and, and the work of Gems for Gems, but uh, you must be doing something to get the attention of all those people who, who uh, you know, care about excellence in, in um, activities. Well, you know what, Rod, um, as I mentioned to you earlier too, um, I am uh, very honored to be accepting those awards, but nothing that we've ever achieved has been done solo we have an incredible team and everyone pitches in constantly so i really feel that that uh, i am a a face that was humbled and honored to accept those awards but it was achieved together well i understand that and and that's very uh good of you to, to state it that way still there requires leadership for an organization to accomplish those things and and uh, obviously you are providing that Thank and it began you. with uh, reaching out to survivors of domestic abuse. Can you tell you, tell us what went through your mind when you began to see the desperate need and, and how you got motivated to, to do something about it? Well, uh, I've always been motivated to provide something high impact. I have absolutely no interest in reinventing the wheel or duplicating services that are already out there. Um, so I, I would not have done anything had I not seen specific holes in, in resources provided for um, specifically uh, survivors of domestic abuse. Um, it all happened by accident, though. I, all I had wanted to do was do that jewelry drive, 
but then so many people came on board and then they wanted to do more and i i felt that if people wanted to be able to step up and help survivors of domestic abuse who was i to turn them away so instead i um rolled up my sleeves and <laughs> tried to start creating opportunities for people to be able to give back in the way that they could give back and i know a lot of charities, uh, obviously money makes the world go round, but the unique thing about GEMS is that we were able during a recession to start this charity uh, on people giving manpower and giving what they could with the skills that they had as opposed to their wallets. Uh, and because of that, we were able to really build a super strong foundation um, of very like-minded people who were passionate about this and wanted to put in time rather than just money. So it's a very different uh, framework, uh, which has been hugely successful. And yeah, I, it's, it has taken on a life of its own. And I have just tried to keep up and keep doing as much justice to it as I possibly can every single step of the way. But what happened was the more we did, the more holes we saw. And because we are designed the way we are, and we're very nimble because of it, uh, we've been able to pivot and and really address the issues in front of us. One of which was um, the shelters really focus on the next steps directly post leaving an abusive relationship. So because they focus on that, we were able to look a little further down the line and see what makes women return five to seven times. And we started addressing those issues. And a huge amount of what we were seeing was based on the financial dependency on the abuser and the emotional dependency. So we really focus on building up women's confidence and uh, and giving them the means to look after themselves and their children. One of which uh, our initiatives, are, two, all of our initiatives really um, attack that. But um, as you mentioned, you were speaking about our Thrive program, which does the self-defense and all that. So that's very empowerment based, obviously skills as well, especially around the financial literacy, literacy piece as well. But then our scholarship program uh, is for trade schools. So it specifically addresses the financial dependency, but interestingly, because it's to trade schools, uh, they're all divided into small sections. So doing well in each section, it's a quick, empowerment piece as well every single step of the way and every single time they go through each chapter they're given something more than a piece of paper it's in here and in here that no one can ever take away from them no matter what happens in the future so yeah that's that that's really what gems has been built on well that's that's very uh, inspiring the thank you um, the ability to bring people out of their uh, despair and into uh, well hope for the future and mm -hmm. a, a uh, enough of a tangible resource being the the resilient human spirit and and the mind mm -hmm. uh, the ability to move on from a, a bad situation to become who knows what you know the the future is so wide open for those who uh, begin to take the steps to climb out of that that uh, pit of despair right so and, Very and, much a mindset and perspective shift. Okay, and and hope is uh, is kind of the uh, key element. To what you're talking about, your or other initiative, hope's cradle, and that's mm -hmm. really want to uh, focus on that for a little bit. First, sure. of all, tell our folks what hope's cradle is. It's got a great name. Uh, Oh, thank you. I'll tell you about the name too. Ask me about the name afterwards because okay. I love how, how it was created. So um, Hope's Cradle is very simply a cradle embedded into the exterior wall of a fire station. And uh, it is to provide an alternative for unsafe infant abandonments. Uh, obviously, unsafe infant abandonments usually result in the baby being deceased. Uh, and the anonymity piece seems to be that pivotal uh, criteria that is making women choose the unsafe option as opposed to uh, the safe option. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. One of which is that a lot of the women are, are trafficked, are young, are in abusive relationships already. And I am not obviously unsafe infant abandonment is never a good decision, but 
I can, I have sympathy for those women and it's super easy to villainize them, but I have sympathy um, for them. And Hope's Cradle really tries to provide something that looks after both the mothers and the babies. Um, but yeah. And then after, after the baby is surrendered, it's, it is the same system that would uh, kick in if the baby was found anywhere else alive, which is it gets taken to the hospital and um, children's services take over from there, essentially. So women who bring a child to birth mm -hmm. are able to bring that baby to a location, which is the uh, an exterior wall, a special facility built into the exterior wall of a fire station. Yes. And they open a door, they put the baby in, yes. and they close the door, they walk away, and they remain anonymous. But as soon as the baby is deposited, there's an alarm goes off. Is that something like that? Yeah, so yeah, but, I can explain the yeah. functionality of it. The door gets opened as soon as the door is opened. Uh, a silent alarm goes off so the mother is unaware of that alarm although all of the steps are listed on the front of the door so there's no surprises for her yeah. after about a minute and a half there's a secondary alarm and it's for her to give her a heads up that a firefighter will be coming soon we just again to further to my point of trying to be as compassionate uh to both sides of this equation we don't want a mother saying goodbye to her baby like this and then have a firefighter open the other side of the door right, like, yeah, yeah. right so so we're trying to keep this as, as respectful and compassionate to both sides as, as possible so the secondary alarm goes off the mother leaves the door is closed and locked so there's no re-entry um the mother has 30 days to be able to reclaim her baby and uh which is really pivotal in my opinion because maybe she needs a place to be able to just know the baby's safe uh, until she gets out of a horrible situation or can make other arrangements or anything like that. Maybe the baby's life was about to be threatened. And there's honestly plenty of examples of that, that I hope eventually Hope's Cradle is used for. I hope it isn't simply for infant abandonment because there's so many situations where mothers know their partner is a threat uh to the baby or maybe maybe sometimes the the mother is a threat and then their partner can can pr put the baby here for um to keep it safe but yeah and then child services takes over after the firefighters to get there and do their first responder protocol so, so um presumably after the 30 days uh there would the the child would be I mean, obviously, the child is cared for from the moment it's uh, yes. left at at the facility. But but after thirty days, the child might be uh, given up for adoption or under foster care. Certainly, foster care. My my hope is that I'm able to change the process and have the babies instantly placed into adoptive homes, uh, into adoptive homes that will hopefully be their forever home. Uh, the foster care system is in my opinion the wrong place for these babies because after 30 days there's no one coming for them and the foster care system is specifically built to provide an opportunity for parents and families to be able to regain custody of the baby but that isn't relevant here after the 30 days so to me it's very very black and white that the baby should have stability as quickly as possible but that's something I'm working on behind the scenes. Uh, and of course, anything policy changing is lots yeah. of red tape, <laughs> but I'm trying. Yeah. Well, the, the whole <laughs> process, and that's another whole topic about uh, yeah. adoption, uh, the the high cost and the red yes. tape with adoption and, and mm -hmm. foster care. But but the, the point here is uh, protecting the life of the baby, giving the mother uh, a, a safe way out of her situation um yes not able or prepared in any way to to care for her child so it's a, f a fascinating uh initiative and and i know there's there's been others around the world um mm -hmm. about the baby box or whatever but but this is very specific to the fire department the connection to the fire department which i think is a, a stroke of genius because Number one, there's a, a fire station in in most communities uh, in mm -hmm. Canada, 
And number two, the people serving in the fire department are already, many of them are volunteers, or at least they're mm -hmm. providing a service. They they want to help their fellow human beings. Yes. So uh, in general, uh, firemen and firewomen, uh, are, uh, their hearts are in the right place to want to provide assistance to those in need. So uh, is there special training that they require when you know to take on this this role i mean basically no yeah. i mean the 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 protocol that is required is the same that they would use anywhere else i mean for the firefighters uh to me wouldn't you rather respond to the situation under your roof or would you rather be responding in the ditch yeah. to me it's like it's the exact same protocol provided the baby's alive which sadly it is not typically, but um, yes, the fire stations are in every community and that is exactly what we want uh, for Hope's Cradle. We want Hope's Cradle to be a household name and just a resource that every community knows is available and is there. Without that, it's never gonna be as successful as, as it could be and as I think we need it to be. Right. Um, so that requires a lot of support, a lot of people stepping up and being willing to help us expand this. Um, just like every initiative with GEMS, we're not going to get there unless every community steps up and, and works collectively and collaboratively on this. There, there may be a fireman or a fire chiefs listening to this or, yeah. you know, mayors of communities and so on. Yes. Uh, who who might begin to wonder, well, what about liability? What what happens? Uh, you know, what if something goes wrong? First of all, you, you're providing a warm, safe place for uh, yes. delivering this child. Someone will be on hand within a couple of minutes to uh, yes. to look after the child. But what if something goes wrong for, you know, that maybe the child arrives in a desperate situation? Is there any uh, liability that, that those people need to be concerned about? So uh, firefighters are protected as long as they follow their protocol. Um, so they have to respond to that call the same as they would anywhere else. So the, the thought of some fire stations and why some fire stations have stayed away from this is what interestingly, they all, without being connected, keep calling uh, the perfect storm, which is what happens if they're out for an hour or two hours. And to me, what really grounds me in that situation is we're competing with a dumpster. Yeah. Like yeah. we have to be <laughs> grounded in that, you yeah. know, sometimes it might not be perfect, but let's remember why we're doing this. Yeah. Right. Let's be grounded in the alternative. And right. surely that is enough to reframe your perspective on that. Something here is 1,000% of the time better than nothing. And exactly. we have to keep that in the forefront of our minds. The other thing, too, is um, the Good Samaritan uh, uh, law is it's not the same for firefighters, but there's an equivalent for firefighters uh, should they follow the proper protocol. Right. If they don't follow the proper protocol, just like police officers, everything, they, they naturally have a liability. Same as if you had a heart attack and they came and didn't do the proper protocol. So there's nothing different. And again, wouldn't you rather be responding to that under your own roof, knowing that it's temperature controlled, which it is, it's insulated, which it is, safe, it is, locked, it is, all of it. There's a camera in the cradle, not anywhere where the mother can be seen, but pointed directly at the bassinet. And you can see the baby. So you can see if the baby is in any sort of distress. Also too, there's always off-duty firefighters that can be called to be able to go in. It doesn't, you know, we, what we work from in a normal situation is the firefighters on duty right now. And we can ha sometimes have catastrophic things happen because there aren't enough working. But there's always ones that are not. And in a situation like this, any group of people would call Bob who's not working today and see if Bob can is available to be able to go, you know, like there's, we don't have to look at this through a, in a linear way like that. We can look at it in, in the big picture and understand that each fire station is a team and surely where babies come into it, we can all rally together and step up in the way that needs to happen. Sure. When did you open the Hope's Cradle in Strathmore? 
December of uh, 2021. 2021. Yeah. Yeah. And, and have you had babies? To, uh... I'm not allowed to say that. Okay. Um, the reason I'm not allowed to say that is because we don't have enough yet. That would pinpoint um, a mother. Okay. Um, so I have to, I have to be confidential, but um, it is, uh, we are very happy with the success of the program. I'll tell you that. Wonderful. Well, yeah. We're... Once we have more, we can be a lot more transparent, but at the moment, Again, as I was mentioning, the anonymity is pivotal. And if we start exposing that, uh, the success of the program is directly in jeopardy. Well, privacy in general is under attack in Canada today. Uh, for, <laughs> <from a> number <laughs> of, uh, sources, there are a number of reasons why that is. And people value yeah. the privacy. And uh, I know right now in British Columbia, medical records are uh, becoming... Yeah. Uh, government property rather than the property of the individual. Uh, it's tragic to see that. that it is. Place. Um, it is. And then you also opened a facility in Landmark, Manitoba. When did that yes. one? That one just happened. It happened, I think I was there in March. Okay. I'm pretty sure they're great. <laughs> uh, the time is all kind of flowing together for me. Um, and and we're really excited too because the landmark um, uh, launch was phenomenal. It was fantastic. So many, uh, there were a few MPs. There was a lot of government presence as well as community, which was really exciting and lovely to see. Um, and uh, we also have an ambassador, uh, Lynn Jeffs in Ontario, who is rallying the Knights of Columbus oh. and all kinds of other yeah, all kinds of other organizations to be able to start moving this across the line in Ontario as well, which is so exciting for us. And and that is what we need. We need people stepping up uh, and they're starting to in Ontario. They um, are kind of starting to hear it's bit by bit by bit right now. So I need all hands on deck and, and everyone to be able to do what they can to make it happen. Well, it's uh, obviously success builds success. And uh, yes. when there are positive stories coming out of these facilities um it's mm -hmm. going to urge other people to to take take steps in their own communities mm -hmm. can you give an idea what kind of costs are involved obviously you have to build a facility uh all the yeah. the uh safety measures that have to be built into it the heating and everything else uh, do you have a, a guess what it, what it might cost yeah we actually we have a very firm cost on it um so in without our team having to travel it's twenty two thousand. and anytime there's travel so obviously it's flights and accommodations and all of that for our construction team they uh it's twenty five thousand. which i have to tell you is the fastest twenty five thousand i have ever seen raised okay. and no one has had difficulty uh, i mean and again to a testament to the hearts and minds of community members they they just keep stepping up. Um, it's kind of hard to argue with the value of this. I mean, even if it was in existence for 10 years and one life was saved, that's worth 10 times that amount. Yeah. Well, um, but I, I do feel, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, because it's a, a fire station and like you say, there's usually somebody there uh, in, in mm -hmm. a, larger communities. Um, so you, there's no manning costs to it, like uh, the ongoing cost of it. I mean, a little bit of heating. Uh, but it's it's there when it's needed, and when it's needed, there's going to be activity. But other than that, yes. once it's built, it's basically, it just sits there until it's needed. It is self-sustaining except for the alarm on the door. So um, sometimes that just gets, it depends on what alarm system is already in place at each uh, facility. But if there isn't an alarm system already in place, it's, I think, $27 a month. Okay. Um, for a separate alarm, but that's the only thing that's not included in the cost. Very, very minimal and very. Yeah. Minimal. Oh yeah. You don't notice that. That's like what is it? Two Starbucks coffees these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, well, I'm a Tim Hortons guy myself, so. Uh, Me too. Me too. <laughs> but anyway, uh, no, it's right. People are are willing to sacrifice. You know, there's that saying: it takes a community to raise a child. In this case. It takes a community to save a child. And yes, that, that's a beautiful way of putting it. Giving people the opportunity to um, be involved in the saving of a life. I mean, to have a direct involvement, just even through a contribution uh, uh, or getting involved in the organization of it or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic. 
So uh, gemsforgems.com is your organization URL. And yeah. how, how can people help? Uh, you know, what, how so, would you recommend people get involved? Or if they want to start something like that in their community, what would they do first? Just reach out to us and you can reach out through, to us through Instagram, Facebook, our website, anywhere we are, you can reach out, LinkedIn. Um, and, and really what we need is a quarterback in each in each area. So essentially what that quarterback needs to do is either create a team themselves, which is so simple. Uh, as long as there's someone willing to take a lead, everyone bands around this. It's awesome. Yeah. Um and, and basically that quarterback will need to present this idea to their town council. We've had zero issues to date, uh, like absolutely zero issues. It's been beautiful. Uh, and find a location willing to house uh, Hope's Cradle. Again, too, that has not been any sort of preventative element at all. Um, and, then, and then the fundraising, which again, the fundraising... You can reach out to church groups. You can reach out to Knights of Columbus. You can reach out to Lions clubs. Every, like there's, it is not hard. The longest it has taken is a week and a half. Yeah. So it's nothing. <laughs> well, I, I know our local, I, I'm involved with a, a pro-life group here in Smithers, BC. I live in Telford. Mm -hmm. But uh, we recently helped a local doctor uh, have access to an ultrasound machine um that wonderful something that we want which also just is reaching out to helping uh women who who need help and, mm -hmm. uh, and a doctor who's willing to provide a service um that that they might not otherwise have and just to have it in his office there's so many ways that people can get involved to help and, definitely yeah yeah and rod too like, i'd love to work with you and your group to be able to bring uh hope's cradle to your area i would absolutely love that wonderful it's not yeah. it's not it's steps but they're not none of the steps are difficult uh at all wonderful and the results wonderful yeah i wanted to just say one thing rod you did yep. mention and I, I didn't mean to skip over it um you said what happens if the baby is uh is farmed already uh obviously as, as sad as, as that would be, um, at that point, a criminal act has already occurred. Um, so th the case would be handled differently anyway. Um, if a baby is unharmed and placed in here, that the mother is uh, will not be pursued for criminal charges, will be completely safe. If the baby is already harmed, um, the, the mother will be pursued because a criminal act has already occurred. Um, now, some people have asked, like, well, if there's no cameras, which is part of our criteria, other than obviously, like I said, facing the, the actual bassinet part, um, then how would you find the mother? Well, from Hope's Cradle, there's no way. But as we talked about, as far as um, our, everyone's privacy being affected these days, there's cameras absolutely everywhere. So um, those will not be utilized at all if the baby is has has no signs of uh, abuse but if it has been abused or if it's in medical distress or anything like that that's a different situation not on our end but it would be looked upon differently uh yeah. by the police and, and that type of thing um the uh the safety of hope's cradle is paramount to us um and the baby once placed in there is nothing there's nothing dangerous nothing that can happen to the baby um, but again, too, we have that safety measure of having that camera pointed at the uh, at the cradle or at the bassinet itself, uh, just as a, an additional layer of safety. Right. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I think it's tremendous. And of course, every human being uh, is in some danger at some time from some cause. Right. And uh, yes. So, uh, helping anyone get through the challenges of life and to uh, be successful to be a survivor, whether it's mm -hmm. a baby or a mother uh, or a yeah. victim of domestic abuse, to become a survivor and a uh, victor, a, a victorious person uh, living out a successful life here in Canada is a, is a great goal. And we thank you, Jordan Guilford of Gems for Gems for uh, your work and, and the team that you have. Obviously, as you've mentioned, you have a tremendous team that works with you. 
um, our thanks and gratitude goes to each one of them as well as to you uh, for this initiative. And we hope that it brings up in many communities across the country. I know it's something I will be speaking about with uh, people in, in my communities. Uh, I my would community. absolutely love that. Yeah. I would yeah. love that. The, the thing is, is that these babies that are found um, are viable. Yeah. Like we're not talking about you know, preemies and everything. They're they're full term viable babies. Yeah, we yeah. can we can do something about that. Yeah, and uh, they depend, like all babies, on uh, human kindness, uh, yes. love, compassion, and yes. care. And so yes. we, you're providing an opportunity for mothers to ensure that their child has that care, even if they're not able mm -hmm. to provide it themselves. Yes. Tremendous. So folks, uh, visit Gems for Gems, G-E-M-S-F-O-R-G-E-M-S -E dot com. Is it com? Yeah, T-O-N. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, uh, Jordan, and we wish you all God's blessings and success in the days ahead and years ahead. Thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. And folks, tune in again next week for another edition of CHP Talks. Thanks.